so happy we alive. On frightening people. So I, I learned an important lesson then. Uh, success doesn't matter very much to the drug warrior. And even when he achieves success, he still needs more money. Of course, when he fails, he needs more money. Uh, the prevalence of urine testing, as you may have heard today, has gone down a little bit in the United States. Particularly small companies have not signed on to test their fear. They just know it's not worth it for them to do so. And so the drug testing industry has looked to this declining application of drug tests as a crisis. So we have to start testing more often, even though the positive rate has declined also. But that's to them a reason. It looks like they've been a success, but what they want is more money so they can push up the rate of use. And so now they're lobbying very hard to start testing other groups of people because in a certain sense they have exhausted some percentage of the market. So failure, success, none of that matters. What matters is a moral crusade and of course a complex which needs to continue making money. The war on drugs is astonishingly corrupt um, and it's astonishingly harmful and yet it goes on because it supplies a livelihood to so many people in America and because it fill, fills people's joy at being a moral crusader and being morally right. That's kind of a sad uh, yeah. commentary on, oh, it sure is. on uh, you know, as, a, as an anesthesiologist, there's no question uh, in my mind that there's a place for, uh, for marijuana and the treatment of uh, chronic pain. Mm -hmm. As a psychiatrist, there's no question in my mind that uh, the treatment of emotional pain, uh, marijuana can be very th uh, therapeutic. And uh, at the same time, uh, marijuana, uh, we know, is one of the least toxic uh, substances mm -hmm. there is. And it's, it's uh, uh, I, I, you know, when I look upon the thing myself, I think one of the paradoxes is, is or, or one of the issues is, is that uh, we physicians were very slow to really come out against uh, cigarette smoking mm -hmm. or just to acknowledge the uh, devastating uh, pulmonary and cardiovascular effects of cigarette smoking and uh, that whole that whole moral lapse if you will uh, that we didn't come out m more strongly against it the mm -hmm. fact that uh, marijuana is associated with smoking even though you and I know that uh, nowadays uh, there's uh, vaporizers available whereby mm -hmm. people can uh, uh, ingest or inhale m cannabinoids with no uh, carcinogenic uh, effect mm -hmm. whatsoever. Uh, there's still that stigma, if you will, just the yeah, idea, it really is the concept of, of smoking. One uh, of the things that I find very difficult is to talk to people, physicians and others who say, well, you can't deliver medicine by smoking. Uh, and I happen to agree that the, probably the future of cannabinoid therapy is in non-smoked material, you know, applied under the tongue, uh, a better way of getting the cannabinoid into the body than by inhaling combusted tar, a pure THC inhaler or the, the vaporizers that you refer to. But people are so adamant about smoking that it's very hard to, to convince them that even though marijuana is smoked, uh, I believe the volume of smoke is, is much lower uh, than the tobacco smoker inhales. And the data would now indicate that marijuana smokers, even, even heavy smokers, are unlikely to get emphysema and unlikely to get chronic obstructive pulmonary disease simply because the volume of smoke is so much less. Now people who smoke both are clearly at risk. I think that's true, although by and large people who smoke marijuana tend to smoke less tobacco when it's available to them or when they're... When yeah, that's always... It's, it's been a puzzle you know? to me, uh, the uh, panic and alarm that the drug warriors express about uh, that the marijuana is so much more potent mm. now when in fact uh, uh, people that smoke marijuana know that uh, it just doesn't take that much. Yeah. And, Even uh, and if you have potent marijuana, yeah. you don't need to you smoke very much. Have smoke. I think it, the data it, are pretty convincing that that's true. One of the intriguing things is that um, the marijuana reform movement of the 70s was turned around by claims that the new marijuana was so dangerous and we'd learned so much more about anti-immune effects and impacts on the sex hormones, which I think are not true. But one of the issues that they were able to continue to focus on was 
Well, the new marijuana is so potent, and yet there is not a single study in the medical literature to show that uh, if the new marijuana is more potent, which I think it probably is a little bit, I think potency has gone up very slightly, that the idea that it's more dangerous is something that needs to be proved. Uh, and yet there have been uh, a number of studies in which you give individuals 1% marijuana to smoke and 5% marijuana to smoke. And as you already know, it turns out that people given the more powerful marijuana simply inhale less. And they take uh, less deep breaths, they take in more air, and they essentially adjust their dose. So there has never been a study to show that more potent marijuana is more dangerous. Now, we have to assume that more potent marijuana is probably less dangerous because the individual inhales less smoke to obtain the amount of cannabinoid that he wants. So the whole idea of that people put so much emphasis on the sort of metatoxicity, yes, I know all of these studies indicate it's not so dangerous, but now it's more potent. Well, they have to do studies to show us, and they are, actually they never will do studies to show us because the indication is that more potent marijuana is not more dangerous. Um, John, you just reminded me of something someone said earlier th uh, this morning about uh, about resistance groups uh, or, or elements of resistance to a more liberalized uh, marijuana policy. And one of the groups that was identified was uh, older people, uh, Republicans, mm. and, and women. And women. Well, and and I'm was. just curious about the women issue of. of uh, uh, it ha I mean, the lie, if you will, has been so r repeated over mm -hmm. and over and over again that I think many mothers uh, are literally scared to oh, death. That's absolutely I mean, right. you know, they they identify the difference between uh, their child, their teenager smoking marijuana, and their teenager shooting up heroin mm -hmm. in their mind is this, is it's is this, is this crazy as the as the scheduling. Yeah. Uh, the federal government. It's Remember the idea we had, we, we talked a little bit about before, that it's necessary uh, to frighten people, and so one then uh, steps back from what has not worked well before and creates new categories to frighten people. I, I talked about the metatoxicity, and the, so yes, marijuana is not so dangerous, but the new marijuana is. Yes, right. marijuana is not so dangerous, but it leads to other drug use. Right. And then finally, the poor mothers of America have been assailed with the idea that uh, if they smoke while pregnant, they will damage their children, of which there's essentially no evidence. And then more importantly, if their youthful children uh, have some marijuana, they will become ruined. Uh, they know at some level it is but they have been assailed. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saddened, but not terribly surprised by a poll which shows uh, that when women are more frightened uh, by marijuana than men, uh, and it simply is because of this overwhelming uh, claim that children have to be protected. So women are so frightened about their children. I mean, children. well, it's kind of like to protect the children, anything goes to, right. to, to, to protect the children. And, yeah, I remember and Ira Glasser, the... Uh, uh, head of the ACLU, who actually spoke here last year at the normal meeting uh, in D.C., that he said that every dreadful uh, anti-freedom uh, element in the United States has generally been justified at some level or other because we have to protect the children. And, and when we did this uh, campaign in New York City recently, the normal advertising campaign about Mayor Bloomberg having smoked marijuana and enjoyed it. Oh, what, what, can you go into that just oh, a little bit? Yeah, just, I, I, mean, I mean, just to, I mean... Nor the Normal no Foundation had gotten uh, a significant grant from an individual who was quite interested in uh, an effective advertising campaign. And I think his background was in part a business background. And so we began talking to some people who had a good record of doing public service kinds of advertising, uh, uh, and we were trying to come up with an idea of how to meet uh, uh, the desires to have a good advertising campaign. And then in May of 2001, when he was running for office, running for the mayoralty in New York City, uh, Bloomberg said, when asked the inevitable question, had he ever smoked marijuana? He said, you bet I did, and I enjoyed it. Well, yeah. he got very little press in May no, of was that a, Was that in the public forum? I mean, oh, yes. It, was, it wasn't it was somebody was secret, no, secretly... No, uh, no. In fact, I later learned, uh, when someone told me about it, that it had appeared in two uh, news outlets, one in New York Magazine and someone else.